Warren, I've been thinking is we can finally have make time to record our children's album that we've been talking about for so many years. I'll write it. You make all the music. It's easy, right? Just chickens and cows and things like that. It'll be great. It'll be a number one seller. You know, some of my earliest childhood memories in life are going with my mother to her work when she was in her 20s to a deaf school in Muncie, Indiana. I don't remember how old I was. I don't remember how many times I went. But some of my earliest memories, if not my very earliest memories, are traced back to that school for the deaf where she taught. There are things I remember about it quite positively. They're cool. They had like, you know, this indoor playground that I really enjoyed. But most of my memories are actually of extreme anxiety and at time terror. And I talked to my sister about it this week and she felt the same way because of the overwhelming noise, the amount of groans, shrieks, words without words, communication without speech. Many of these children were in the early stages of development, so they didn't know how to sign yet. And many of them were severely cognitively delayed as well. Being deaf was only one of a myriad of other complexities in their lives. And so the capacity to learn sign was delayed over a long period of time. And so many of them, they didn't know how loud they were being because they couldn't hear themselves. They had yet to gain oral speech, and they did not yet have sign language. And so the room was just filled with a deafening din all of the time. Uh, one of these young people was named Curtis. My family would often watch Curtis. He came from uh, uh, an impoverished family where I grew up. Um, there's a lot of economic complexity there. Uh, and Curtis uh, did not have speech, and his family wasn't teaching him sign language, and they were ill-equipped to do any of those things. And so he would just scream. And I remember one day, one of my earliest memories is I took Curtis's hat from him, as three-year-olds often do, and I said, Curtis, wear it sideways like this. And he bit me in the nose. If any of you ever been bit in the nose, it is not a comfortable experience. But what I remember more than the teeth marks on my nose, and there were teeth marks on my nose, was the shriek that happened before. Uh, and sadly, Curtis's life didn't end well. But what I remember in that time, as I look back at those early days of development, is one, a sense of um, uh, deep familial pride that my family has always been marked by compassion, especially for suffering children and, and the poor of our community. And that's been my, my mother's entire career and my sister does the same. Uh, but also one of, of complexity, as I remember with a heavy heart, that room where Young children had needs. They wanted to communicate something, but they didn't have words to speak. And so all it came out was as groans, as shrieks, as cries for help without words to communicate. Today, as we continue in our sermon series through the book of Romans, we're going to hit Romans 8, 26 through 27, where we're going to examine the nature of prayer particularly prayer when we don't have words to speak. Prayer when maybe the pain that we are feeling or the confusion that we are feeling is so deep, we don't have words to communicate to God. And the Apostle Paul talks about groans that come from the Spirit. So today we're going to look at three things. First, prayer begins and is sustained by weakness. The Christian faith never outgrows weakness. In fact, the more you mature, the more you recognize your weakness. Second, we're going to look at what this means when the Spirit groans within us. When there are, are wounds or pains or confusions so deep, words can't be found, but the Spirit moves within us and groans to God the Father. And then third, we're going to look at the assurance we have that the Spirit is our intercessor, and He prays for us when we don't know what we ought to pray. So if you would, turn with me to Romans 8, verses 26 through 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
You know, in all of life, weakness is a a deficiency that you seek to overcome, right? If you feel physically weak, you go and you work out. If you feel cognitively weak, you study. If you feel relationally weak, you invest in friendships. Weakness is something that you seek to overcome and grow out of. But here's the interesting paradox of Christianity. The more mature we become as Christians, the more self-aware of our weakness we become. Right? You will never hear a Christian say, I have grown so much in my faith that I no longer have to consult God on things anymore. I've outgrown prayer. You guys have to call your dad all the time. I've outgrown that. I don't need that anymore. I have grown so much like him, I don't have to talk to him anymore. Right? When your kids go off to college or they go into the workforce, what do you want them to do? It is not a sign of actual healthy bonding if they call you all the time. Right? That's actually a sign of like unhealth and a lack of differentiation. They need to go off and they need to be their own person. I got in a lot of trouble for this. Dad, you might remember. I didn't call my mother for three months. I didn't think of it, all right? I think it's because they sent me off well. When I called her, she said, oh, I forgot I had a son. Who is this? Uh, She was not happy with me. Uh, But there is is something in, in our lives that says you need to differentiate. You need to grow in wisdom so you don't have to consult your parents on everything anymore. That is not the Christian life of maturity. It's paradoxical because actually the more we grow as Christians, the bigger our need for God becomes. The more aware of our weakness we are, the bigger the power of the cross becomes, the more the goodness of Christ saturates our lives and the more we want to reach out to God for counsels, for support, or just for companionship. It's actually not a sign of maturity to become distanced from your Father in heaven. It is actually more Christ-likeness because how does Christ Jesus exist in the perfect life of the Trinity in perfect and perpetual communion with his Father? One of my favorite books on the life of praying uh, is called The Praying Life by Paul Miller. Has anyone read The Praying Life by Paul Miller? Yeah, it's a great book. Um, The Miller family, you know, his father was a a leader, I think, in the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America. And then Paul wrote this beautiful book on prayer. And one of the reasons why I like it is because uh, Paul's daughter uh, is uh, very uh, far on the autism spectrum. She's almost entirely nonverbal. Uh, she can only communicate through a keyboard. Um, uh, but it's interesting as he reflects on helping his daughter Jill grow in communication with him, how much he is learning on how to grow in communication with his father in heaven. And in fact, if, a number, if enough of you ask me to read it together, I will totally have this be our next reading with the rector because it's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. But in the chapter, Learning to Be Helpless, this is what Miller writes about this paradox about uh, the more mature we become, the more we have a sense of our weakness and the more we will pray. Here's what he says. Less mature Christians have little need to pray. When they look at their hearts, which they rarely do, they seldom see jealousy. They're barely aware of their impatience. Instead, they are frustrated by all the slow people they keep running into. Less mature Christians are quick to give advice. There's no complexity to their worlds because the answers are simple. Just do what I say and your life will be easier. And I know all this because the they I've been talking about is actually me. That is what I'm naturally like without Jesus. Surprisingly, mature Christians feel less mature on the inside. When they hear Jesus say, apart from me, you can do nothing in John 15, 5, they nod in agreement. They reflect on all the things they've done without Jesus, which have become nothing. Mature Christians are keenly aware that they can't raise their kids. It's a no-brainer. Even if they are perfect parents, they still can't get inside their kids' hearts. That's why strong Christians pray more. This is just the beginning uh, that I want to talk about today, is this paradox that actually growing in maturity is recognizing our weakness. But the more mature we become, it's not as if our scope of our weakness shrinks. It actually expands. There's some bad news for you. (laughs) 
Uh, but the good news is what it actually does is expand your need for God in your life. That's actually good news. So do you bring your weakness to God or do you just try to resolve it yourself? Do you bring your parenting failures to Jesus because he wants to hear about them? Do you bring your marital strife to Jesus because he wants to talk with you about it? Do you bring your fear of the future of our, of our country to God? Because he wants to talk to you about his kingdom, by the way. Do you bring your weakness to him? The more that we grow, the more we recognize our weakness and it leads us to greater prayer. But we also see in our text today that there are times in which we don't know what to pray. Our pain is so deep, our confusion is so profound, uh, or maybe we just can't see past ourselves. Maybe we have a trauma that is like, comes down like a, a shield that blinds us and we just can't see past it. They're not leaving, they're getting ready to get baptized. <laughs> and we just, we have a father-son baptism today, it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> um, and you just can't see past it, right? You just can't see even that person in front of you because there's something so deep in you, you can't resolve it. Well, what we see here is that the Apostle Paul says, there are times in our lives where we feel so weak, we don't know what to pray, and God still calls us to come to him. He calls us to bring our groanings to him, to bring that pain that is beyond words, that longing that is grasping at words. And he says, bring that to me. Look at verse 26 again. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, some very faithful Christians interpret this to mean glossolalia. What that means is the speaking of in tongues, right? And we believe in the speaking in tongues. You know, we believe that there are such things as speaking in tongues, but that's not what this text is talking about, okay? Um, because one, this text is clearly talking to all Christians, not just some Christians. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, that the gifts of the Spirit aren't given to all. And therefore, you know, the gift of tongues is not a, a standard test to see if you actually have the Spirit or not, right? But in this text, he's clearly talking to all Christians. Ergo, speaking in tongues cannot be what he has in mind, Okay. So what does he mean? I, I, think, I think it's very similar to what I experienced growing up in, in that school for the deaf, where there are children on all different ranges of cognitive capacity, crying out for help where words can't be found. Some of them might've just had a pain in their stomach. And cognitively, they could not figure out whether it was a hunger pain they had to go to the bathroom or they were sick. And they didn't even have words to say, someone help me. So all they would do is they would cry out. And their only way of understanding that they were crying out because they couldn't hear it was one, obviously their vibrations in their throat, but primarily because those ladies over there, when I do this, they care enough about me that they turn around and come and do something about it. And it was almost entirely young women is what I remember. I think my mom was likely 30 at the time, would you say, probably? 20s, okay, in her 20s, okay. Um, they had kids young. Um, but she was in her 20s. And I remember it was just a, a bunch of ladies because it was, it was right adjacent to, to Ball State University. And that was kind of the big teacher training school in Indiana at the time. Um, and these women were just so incredible. I just remember the love that they had for these children. Even from that early age, you could see it. But here's the interesting thing. <laughs> that child having a resolution to their need was not contingent upon their capacity to articulate it. They couldn't articulate what their needs were. They couldn't say, I have a pain in my stomach because I have not eaten yet today. Will you please give me a banana, right? They didn't have that. And so what was it? They completely relied upon the teachers to interpret what their needs were. And it's the same thing in prayer family. God doesn't need you to tell him what you need. He doesn't need to consult with you. 
to say, oh, I didn't realize that really this is what you need deep down. And this is freeing to us because so often in our lives, we don't actually know what we need. We just, need, we just know the one we need to go to. When we cry out in the spirit, and this is why I wanted to read our Psalm passage today, right? Because in this beautiful Psalm, we see that the spirit upholds us with a willing spirit, right? That reveals that there is no sharp divide between the human will and the will of God. The spirit can move within your moving, act within your acting, cry within your crying, groan within your groaning, and it is still your groaning, and yet it is empowered and enacted by the spirit. And so what we see in our text is not just that the spirit is kind of mysteriously groaning within us, right? And we can't hear it or know it. No, it's that we are groaning to God, but it is the spirit bringing our groans to the ears of God. Because that is the one place where what we actually need can be disentangled and resolved. He doesn't expect you to come up with a plan for what you need. He knows it far better than you do. But what he does say is, come to me with your groaning because I'm the one person that can help. How many of you in your life have had a pain that is so deep that there just are no words to speak to God? There are just none. He invites you to bring that to him. He can handle your groaning. How many of you have been in a place where uh, the suffering has been so long that you just say, I am so tired of praying for this because you don't seem to be doing anything about it. And that he can listen to your groaning. He can receive your groaning. We recognize that the spirit can act within us, move within us to bring those cries of our hearts that are out of the reach of words and bring them to the one person who can actually bring help. So first we see the power of praying in our weakness. Second, we see the power of groaning when we don't have words. But now let's look at something else. We also see that the spirit is called the intercessor. He is the one who brings your prayers to God, but he's also the one that searches your heart and says, these aren't the prayers you are praying, but ought to be praying, and those are the ones I'm gonna pray for you. Uh, because it's interesting. Uh, we're going to look at our, our, our gospel reading today in which the Spirit is called the helper or parakletos, which is a legal f term for defense attorney. So lawyers in the room, there's a lot of lawyers in the room. God is a lawyer. You won't hear that very often, but he is, but he is a defense attorney. So I don't know what to tell you if you're, if you're not, you know, if you're more on the, the other side, but your spirit is a defense attorney. What he functionally does is he, you know, if you ever seen it in a court case, he will just say, what my client means to say is, and how many of you have ever led a prayer out to God and you wish you could pull it back? Because you're like, that was totally not what we need right now. Guess what? God didn't hear it. He didn't hear it. It fell to the ground. And the spirit on your behalf through Jesus says, here's what he actually meant. And he offers the right prayers to him that you miss. Look at verse 27. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now that might be kind of confusing. So two, I think, helpful passages might help make it clear to us. Uh, the first is 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. It says this, for the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for who knows the person's thoughts except for the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, this is interesting because this is a very Trinitarian passage. So the spirit is the one who searches everything, even the depths of the thoughts of God. Now, the thoughts of God is uniquely appropriated or uh, assigned to the Son because the Son is named what? The Logos. Logos means word, but it also means thought. The Logos, the Son, is the very thought of God. We're getting in very deep Trinitarian waters here, you all. This is St. Augustine here. This is St. Aquinas. This is Calvin. This is everybody. But the Spirit, who is both the Spirit of the Son 
and the Father is uniquely described as the one that searches the thoughts of God. The infinite thoughts of God, he has plunged the depths of the Father and the Son by the Spirit, and he knows it. And then in our passage today, we see that the Spirit knows our hearts. If the Spirit can plunge the infinite depths of the thoughts of God, family, he can handle the confusions of your finite mind. You might not understand what's going on inside of you. I don't. The greatest mystery in the world to me is me. But I am not a mystery to the Spirit. There is one that knows me. There is one that knows every bit of me. And yes, that is, <laughs> that is a terror, right? At the beginning of our worship service, we prayed the Spirit would cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. What a beautiful image, the thoughts of our hearts, not a division of head and heart, the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. So what do we see? Yes, we confess the thoughts of my heart aren't good, but we also recognize that what the Spirit can do is he can find the redemption inside of you that Christ is working. And the part of you that is off, you are often blind to, the part of you that God is working within, the part of you that you wish was more presented to your children or your spouse or your parents, he takes that part, the sanctified part, and he offers that to your Father in heaven. He doesn't do this as a word of condemnation, he does it to liberate us by his work in our lives. But the other passage I want to point out is this, is John 14. And I've already kind of spoiled the ending a bit, but here we go. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. I do, I like the ESV. I think this is a, a weak point in the ESV. Helper is just not as good of a translation as advocate because advocate is more clearly a legal term. And parakletos is a defense attorney. And so what we see is that even in our prayers, we have a defense attorney. We have somebody that says, what Tim meant to say was this, right? So what this does is it frees us to bring confused prayers to God because it's not like, you know, if I pray for the wrong thing, it's going to set the course of history in the wrong direction. And it can free you to pray as God is moving your heart and recognize that the spirit on your behalf is going to sort it out for you. Now, that doesn't free you to sin in your praying, okay? It doesn't mean you can pray like, Lord, may that political candidate, I don't like, choke on a pretzel and die. That's sinning. You can't do that, okay? But it does mean that God doesn't need you to have the solution for him. And he can handle your imperfect solutions because he's just going to ignore the bad parts and he's going to have the Spirit pray for you anyway. That doesn't actually make you non-existent. What it does is free you just to come to him. It frees you to say, I don't know what my child needs right now, but he needs something, and so I'm going to pray for this. And God, I'm going to count on you to give him what he actually needs. Because what our Father simply is saying is he gives us an advocate in the Spirit. He gives us a high priest in the Son. So the Father is just saying, just come to me. Come to me in the midst of your confusion. Come to me in the midst of your anger. Come to me in the midst of the frustrations that you are feeling. Just come to me and I'm gonna sort out the rest. Because brothers and sisters, we have the great privilege that our God actually wants us to come to him. That our God has removed our sins from us as far as the East is from the West. Our God has adopted us in his son, Christ Jesus, as sons and daughters of God. And he wants us to come to him every moment of every day, bringing our weakness to him, bringing our groaning to him, and bringing our confusion to him because he just wants us to come to him. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would keep us weak, keep us dependent, 
Keep us in a place where we know that we need you. Lord, we trust that you will hear our prayers by your spirit and by your son. Lord, would you lead us into a praying life, a life filled with the spirit, a life of groaning to you and calling out to you, the one source of help. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.